Thank you so much, Professor Dick, for being with us. We, we read your article on The Guardian, and that was very worrying because <laughs> we have seen the videos of the fish having microplastic, but hearing uh, about plastics in our blood was kind of alarming and disgusting. And then reading later that now babies have it in their bodies and it's in our lungs. And so I was watching your videos. You mentioned the real problem are the nanoplastics, that we can't even measure those. So we don't even know how deep this thing goes. Am, am I getting that correct? Like, this could be even worse because of nanoplastic particles that could be in our body right now? Yes, that, that is correct. Uh, in fact, you know, the nanoplastics or the nanoscale plastic particles are, are very likely more hazardous than, than the micro sized plastics. Uh, and that's because uh, one side, you know, that's much smaller. And we know that these very small particles can more easily be absorbed by the body. They can easily trans transport uh, uh, across these, these uh, epithelial membranes than, than the larger particles. So that is one thing. And the other thing is the smaller the particle, the larger the relative up surface of the particle. This has to do with the surface volume ratio. And that means uh, that uh, the smaller the particle, the higher the chemical reactivity as well. So these very small particles can absorb or can concentrate much higher concentrations of uh, of contaminants. And uh, so, yeah, that's true. Uh, and, and it's very true that we have not still, we don't have the methods yet to measure these, uh, these very small particles. Even our study in, in, in blood is uh, in human blood. For me, it was not really surprising to find particles there. But even in our study there, we focused only on a certain range size that was determined by the, the, the diameter of the needle we used mm -hmm. for taking the blood sample and, and the filter for filtering the, the extract. And the filter was uh, at a, a, a size, a grain size of, I think, what was it, 700 nanometers. So even we only had looked in this case at these micro sub micro particles and not really the nano sized <laughs> so yeah there is a whole world there we don't know about and, and that is a that is quite uh yeah scary i'm yeah. gonna say scary you know but uh, you have to put everything into uh, a, a broader perspective oh. the thing is you know we know that any particle any chemical can end up in our bloodstream this is this is the case you know mm -hmm. and so in this case we're talking about plastic particles mm -hmm. but then the plastic particles you should put it in in in, in the context of we live in an in a in a multi-particle world mm -hmm. we're exposed to so many different particle types look at the exhaust uh, the exhaust particles from diesel cars whatever mm -hmm. you know the particles from combustion or by your barbecue or smoking etc cetera, etc cetera. so we are exposed to uh, multiple are very, you know, different, diverse particles. Mm -hmm. And so the, the key question is already, you know, how much are these plastic particles contributing to the total particle load mm -hmm. in our body? Right. And the second question is, are these plastic particles perhaps more uh, toxic? Do they have a different toxic profile exactly. than the other ambient particles we exposed? Right. And I think, yeah, there is something to say for that. Because these plastic particles, they are, they are diverse and highly complex. Contaminant is not one contaminant. It's, it's a group of diverse and highly complex. Why? Because we're dealing with so many different polymer types and different additives, chemical additives that are added, compounded in these, in these, in these plastics. Mm -hmm. and, and then we know these plastic, can, as a sponge, they can concentrate environmental contaminants from the environment can even act as a factor, <coughs> transport factor for pathogens, you know, bringing that into your body, etc. So there are more aspects, I think, that, that need uh, to be researched for, for, for plastic particles. But it's, as, you can, as I can already tell you, know, this is a very complex issue. It's not something you can solve in, uh, in a couple of years' time. And this isn't just plastic right. itself. It's all petroleum-based products. You were mentioning diesel. 
Well, the, the interesting thing is, you know, if you if you talk about clothes, and um, yeah, we wrote. Uh, I wrote an article uh, a year ago, and then one of the conclusions of that review article was, you know, hey, listen, uh, we're looking at these plastic particles, and one of the more predominant plastic particle types are fibers, mm -hmm. fibers particles. Mm -hmm. the, the microfibers, the nanofibers. Um, but what about all these natural fibrous particles? And mm -hmm. if you look, and nobody's really looking at a few, few studies now pop up that show, hey, but if you also look at the natural fibers compared to the plastic fibers, mm -hmm. then some, in some cases there are more natural fibers around than the plastic fibers. And then the, then the question arises there, you know, so what about the toxicity of these natural fibers? Nobody looks at that. But again, okay. So in, in that sort of context, you have to uh, mm -hmm. to put the, to put the, the whole issue of uh, I think microfibers in your case is the, the appropriate name, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Microfibers, micro. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy that you that you uh, got rid of these uh, petroleum based polymers, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh. And, uh, for me, this is the only way we, we can go, you know, because I, I'm getting very pessimistic if I think about, you know, what, what the industry is doing, you know, the plastic industry, and they're pushing it all the time, and they they have these these regrettable substitutes, you know, they, they, they change additives from bisol A to bisol F, you know, when yeah. they keep it busy for another couple of years, and it's just as toxic as it is, as original compound, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, I'm not seeing this transition happening very quickly now, you know, yeah. very rapidly. And the only push you can think of uh, was, a, I think it was an article out in, uh, in Science a couple of mm -hmm. weeks ago saying, you know, we should stop or reduce, uh, diminish the use of the production of plastic in general. So because... Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm talking a lot now. No, 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 keep going. Please keep going. No, no, go for it. Because, because the point is, the point is, and, and this is the scaring story behind it, I think, is at the moment we don't know how much plastics we are exposed to. And the, the, this first study in blood, and there's a couple of studies in placenta, they don't tell you anything about um, the general population. You cannot extrapolate these studies. These are pioneer studies. They only tell you we can detect plastics in blood or placenta, etc. But the, the real question behind that is, you know, what are the levels that cause effect, can that cause harm? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, we have not established these, these, these effect levels, you know, these threshold levels. Uh, so there, there is a, I mean, a little bit of plastic probably is not so terrible in compared to all the other particles you're exposed to, but you need to know, you know, where is the plastic going? It's in your blood. Obviously, it will be uh, uh, it will be uh, uh, excreted, you know, through your bile, your urinus. A fraction, maybe uh, accumulating, and that is maybe not good. You know, accumulating in certain organs, maybe taking this this, this blood brain barrier or what you say, the placenta, mm -hmm. entering uh, you know the the fetal side of the placenta as well. Um, and and th these are not uh, these are not good things. But the basic question is, we need to know more about the exposure levels. In order to say something about the risks, and um, okay. as you know, you know you can find plastic everywhere in the world. Yeah. In the biosphere, you can find them in in every animal we looked so far. And we also looked in a couple of farm animals mm -hmm. in the blood. You, know, you find plastics, okay? So it's it's everywhere, and the highest concentrations can be found particularly inside your house, you know, inside your homes. Right. Particularly if you don't ventilate very well, you, it's accumulating in dust. And and the dust thing is, that illustrates straight away, in a couple of studies, mm -hmm. demonstrated very nicely, you know, anything you eat or drink during these activities, there's deposition of plastic particles on your food and drinks. Everywhere, so everything is contaminated wow. to a certain degree with these microplastics. And well, the many I could say another thing, you know, probably everything is also contained with other chemical contaminants, etc., etc., that are everywhere in your house as well. And mm -hmm. so, 
the focus is now on these micro nanoplastics, and um, and you can see if even if you if you, we inhale them, we we ingest them, but we also uh, uh, we also uh, there's also deposition of these particles everywhere on your food, on your on your drinks, and. Uh, in, in house dust and and you can understand that babies particularly children that that, that crawl on, mm -hmm. on the floor you know they put things in their mouth and that they expose to dust and to these plastic particles in particular so um and and then of course there is the link we know that children and 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 and, and your early life in particular uh, is most sensitive to to both particles and mm -hmm. certain chemical exposures like endocrine and certain chemicals, mm -hmm. of course. And, uh, and you see that, uh, and that is maybe the, the other scary part of the story, you know, you see that everything that is plastics in the environment, mm -hmm. whether it's waste or it's an item in your house or, or you know, furniture or it's a polymeric paints on buildings or whatever, the final, the final destination of these plastics mm -hmm. is to become micro and nanoplastics. So, meaning having said that, that means that because only the amount of plastic already in the environment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, mm -hmm. will will eventually uh, uh, break down in smaller particles, uh, and 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 uh, so, mm -hmm. consequently, the increasing the exposure levels in the coming decades. And because, only because of that. I'm not talking about still the plastic waste to come and, and all these. I'm talking about it. So the scenario is not looking very good. Wow. Um, right. right. Yeah. So, like sorry, I just had one question. So one of our, we switched our packaging to uh, compostable packaging that's made from, one of the ingredients is made from PBAT. Uh, which actually derives from um, from what's it, it? It derives from petroleum, and it's what makes it compostable. Is that one of the solutions that plastic might be coming well, to? Well, there is a, a lot of confusion about these these bio based plastics or bioplastics or whatever they call them. Yeah, uh, bio and 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 and, and, and um, again, the, the the real synthetic plastics. Like you, maybe you used uh, in previous years, you know, for your clothes. These are, you know, these are synthetic, uh, and they they hardly degrade. They 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 don't rot. Plastic doesn't rot. That's why it's such a beautiful material. In fact, you know, it's, it's very sustainable. In that sense, it's yeah. quite sustainable. You know, it, it doesn't rot. Right. It's flexible. It's cheap, etc. Right? So you know that as well. Mm -hmm. But it uh, it. Um, it accumulates in the environment, of course, because it doesn't break down. It it it, it breaks down in small and small mm -hmm. particles when it's exposed to UV light, etc. But it doesn't rot, so it, it doesn't go. It is not degraded into the original elements, you know, like water, oxygen, and carbon, etc. So there, there, so yeah, and then so that is the good thing of the story. Mm -hmm. If you if you look at for example, your natural fibers from wool or whatever, mm -hmm. they, they probably will degrade. They will be, they will yeah. disappear. You know, they will be done there for for hundreds of years and accumulating in the environment. The same is true for these bio-based plastics. Mm -hmm. But again, there is a certain chance, you know, that it, it also produces um, for a while micro and nanoplastics, particularly if if the story is that it biodegrades and it seems only to do that, uh, not in your backyard or not in the marine environment or whatever, but, but only under certain conditions of, you know, yeah. 200 degrees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a bit of a misleading thing, but yeah, but it's always better than, than using uh, the synthetic stuff, but for sure. Wow. So with the bio-based plastics, the issue is that it has to have a very specific environment to biodegrade. Um, right. So, plastics, uh, from my understanding, in the 20s, 30s, the 50s, started increments were developed and then started being used widely. And right now, uh, in the fashion industry, 
textiles. Uh, polyester makes up about 57% of uh, all clothes. 57, all yeah. It's like a million metric tons per year uh, last year were produced in fabrics, of which like um, 57 million metric tons were polyester. So polyester is straight PET, plastic bottles. It's the same thing. So a lot of people are recycling PET plastic bottles to make recycled polyester or other items out of plastic. But from what I'm hearing, this is not a solution because in the end... No, it's what we call, uh, it's maybe a little bit of, you know, what they call cream washing or whatever, you know, but it's not a solution at all. It's like even, it's the same thing like, you know, you, you take the... the, the but this is a personal view as well. Eh? If you take, you go to the ocean cleanup and you take all these rubbish, you know, from from the Pacific Ocean, and you try to make uh, glasses or whatever, sunglasses or whatever you have from it, you know, it's good for the awareness raising. You know, that people understand there's a problem, but it doesn't solve. It's not efficient recycling. It's it's not. Uh, but yeah. But for me, you know, you, you, you can't go from, from white to black or from black to white. Um, you yeah. always have to deal with periods where you look at the intermediate solutions. But of course, it's not, it's not an optimal solution. Right. So uh, what people are doing is they're using a microfiber filter in their laundry machine. Yeah, the microfiber. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is also for me a sort of win-win, you know, a quick win. What we call yeah. it a quick win. Yeah. But if you think about it, you know, if you think about it, yeah. I think it solves some of the problem because, you know, it started, people looked at these microfibers, uh, they are released in the, through a washing machine in, in the effluent and then and, and they're not filtered out by all these seaweed treatment plants. So they end up in the in surface waters, a small percentage, maybe 10 or 5 percent or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so to, so to use a filter could be very effective, but then the question is, what are you doing with the uh, right. with the filter material? You know, what do you, what you end up with? You know, are you, how do you dispose it? it, it, it to my opinion, it, it's it's with all these additives and dyes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. To my opinion, it's almost chemical waste. You know, if you concentrate that, and if you just dispose it mm -hmm. uh, in your in your in your um, garbage, you know, like that, it may be released partly to the air again, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, yeah, but the, it, it's a quick win, but I think it's not so People should also realize that maybe even more fibers are released from your clothes during, um, during use of your clothes. Yeah. Uh, even maybe the production, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, and we see, you know, it's not only the washing machine. If you look at your your air conditioners, if these filters are also full of fibers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's part. It, it's not you. You don't have the whole picture there for clothes. You know, if you look only at these washing machines. For me, I already said, you know, years ago, I can't understand, you know, that we still have these washing machines that didn't change for 20, 30, 40 years, and they. Why is 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 there so much force necessary? You know, and all this water, etc. Maybe we don't need any water, you know, to do it, to clean your clothes. But this is this requires innovations, you know. Right. I mean, people. I, I'm not sure if people think about the next generation of washing machines that are much more efficient in terms of water use, energy use, etc., right. etc. Et and then again, of course. Um, and for me, the, the 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 big close issue is, of course, that that we buy all these 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 clothes from 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 Asia and and and, and mm -hmm. these clothes, you know, cut, we have to cut alone here as well in Spain. Eh? So you, mm -hmm. you you buy a t-shirt, and I, I should be fair, you know, when you buy a t-shirt here, this is cotton maybe, but you can buy a t-shirt for three euros there, and you use it for two months, and the, the holes fall. You can see the holes already, mm -hmm. but spontaneously there, you know, it falls apart. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Throw it away. Yeah. So we need clothes that are that are um, sustainable, that people bring back to the 
to the tailor, you know, if something is wrong, it's before they can repair it. Right. This is not common practice these days anymore. Right. You see? Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, it's part of the consumer um, habit now that it's almost every month we see more and more people buying clothes and it's just, um, we're seeing an increase in the fashion industry as well that uh, polyester, everything's increasing for demand in clothes. It's not just polyester, but also man-made, fi- um, man-made cellulose fibers like um, linen and cotton and even wool itself. And when we started working with wool, I did a test to not wash my, my wool sweater for a year. And all I had to do on the worst times that it smelled was just to air it out. It didn't, re- it didn't require any washing. And it just, I don't think we need to be washing our clothes this consistently, but because we're, we've switched now to this terrible fibers and they retain so much bacteria, now we constantly have to be washing after one or two uses. But with animal fibers, even merino wool, I haven't found a need to wash it. It just, yeah. it's antibacterial. It doesn't retain any bacteria. Yeah, exactly. But, um, well, you say, you, you said that, you know, and then, then I think straight away about uh, textile fibers in general, whether they're natural, anthropogenic, or synthetic. Mm. You all really have, if you really want to go for eco friendly uh, fiber types, you need to consider all these additives and dyes yeah. as well. But they contain, many of them contain nasty chemicals. Of course. So we, well, we did a test called the. Okay. Yeah. The, Let's talk about that. The leave no trace apparel. So we have natural dyes um, that we did a test, and we yeah. offer natural red, which is made from cochineal, natural blue, indigo, and natural gray eucalyptus. So our goal is to make a hundred percent biodegradable collection that doesn't leave a trace when it biodegrades. And um, luckily, we're in Peru, which they have a history of natural dyeing. So there's there, there's a big door up there, but it, it takes a while because every the consumer wants it to be a perfect item. And with natural dyes, you're going to have inconsistencies, and there's a lot of things that go behind it. So it's um, so we we did read about the low impact dyes, which is currently being what's popular now, um, and we're trying to get into the natural dyeing, but it's still it. it the main issue I think I'm finding is with the fabric finishings. It's it's making the f- the fabric ready to be cut. So it's adding this silicone to the fabric, and that we're finding difficult to replace or finding alternatives. But I don't know if if this uh, if this silicone is something that is also alarming. Is this like effective? It's it's basically a conditioner that you add to your fabric. Um, but it is petroleum based. Well, the thing is, and and, and, and this is one of the the key uh, questions. You know, this sounds a bit strange, but there is no. I mean, plastics are still the future. <laughs> and there, there's the nanoplastics now showing up more and more. This is a booming industry. So these are nanoscale plastics with nanoscale additives and all these things and combinations of carbon and plastics and that these make much lighter plastics. You can find them already everywhere in your cars, in the airplanes, etc. So this is no general plastic. So, but there is legislation now, at least in Europe, you know, against all, you know these single-use plastics, replace them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's even now, you know, legislation by the EU saying, you know, we have to ban thousands of these nasty chemicals. Most, uh, a lot of them are coming from plastics mm-hmm. uh, by 2025, etc. So there is a lot of movement there, mm-hmm. but there are a lot of sources of plastic uh, that generate micro nanoplastics yeah. that, you know, that are much more difficult to tackle. For example, the polymeric paints. Everywhere on buildings, ships, oh. we use these polymeric paints these days. And the thing is, you know, it it erodes, you know, it it, it, it it fragmentates in time, particularly outside on buildings, on ships, and there's no way you can you can you can recycle it or whatever, you know. It, no, it's designed to be wasted almost, you see. And uh, so this is one source. The other source is, of course, the car tires, you know, with the, the, the synthetic rubber components there as mm-hmm. well. And uh, so uh, if you go really for the natural stuff, which I really like, you know, because I think you you really have to also to, to look at these these uh, 
is it the, the, to be eco-friendly and to look at the, these additives as well as the dyes. You know, I think there, I think there are solutions uh, in the pipelines yeah. where you know where you can go more friendly. Yeah. It's always a sort of balance you have to find and compromise. I know that, you know, because there is also the, the issue of uh, you want to have safe clothes, you know, you want to. But uh, yeah. I guess, you know, it, it's not normal that in some products, you know, 40% of the product itself is rubbernated flung retardants, you know, 40%. I know products like that. <laughs> that is pretty normal. Well, um, Actually, to add on to that, because our goal is to make clothing like it used to be made before all this. And so um, we've identified all the chemicals used in our clothes. And the biggest ones, like you mentioned, were the synthetic dyes, but also the chemical finishing. Yeah. So the only chemical finishing we use is silicone, and that is to improve the, the hand, the feel, of the clothes, and we're looking for a natural alternative. Yeah. But for the synthetic dyes, like Melissa mentioned, in Peru we have a lot of natural plant dyes. So um, some of the shirts we're making have 100% eucalyptus uh, or cochinilla. So in yeah. our case, we don't use any flame retardants or any other chemicals, and it's not necessary to use. So the majority of the clothing being made we can make clothes without petroleum. So even our elastics, we can make out of natural rubber, which uh, grows in Peru and Indonesia from the rubber tree, yeah. and cotton that's already being made by some companies. Um, the dyeing can be all plant-based. So it's just the silicone that's, uh, that we're still researching on, but we've identified everything to make clothes that's completely plastic-free, but also completely petroleum um, product free. Yeah, I can see your it's point. Yeah. For but, everyday clothes. Yeah, yeah. Right. Basically, you know, what I even say, you know, with the plastics are still the future. I, I meant to say, you know, what we should do now is to reduce plastic consumption, production, etc. But we, and that is what this research is doing. We have to identify the the ugly and bad plastics. Because there are also lots of good plastics around that are really necessary. You know, they really are. You, we can't miss them in, in the medical science mm. or medical hospital, etc. So the sector, so that they're, they're good, but also bad and nasty ones. And I think the disposable uh, mm -hmm. uh, ones are the you know the nasty ones, of course. But uh, silicone, at least. Uh, to my, and this is a personal opinion, you know, at, at, at least it's not something that falls apart very quickly, you know, you can, and you can, you can, you can, it's, it's something that, that you, maybe you can recycle it, I'm not sure, uh, or, or I have no idea about that, but, uh, but of course, I, I, I straight away think about uh, silicone in terms of uh, breast implants, etc. cetera. Mm. Uh, silicone and there is a problem there but these are also, of course purposely put into inside of your body and yeah. it's, it's a different story but some people may make that association maybe i'm not sure <laughs> i believe the silicone we use is um liquid based and it's put into it runs correct me if i'm wrong but it's in after the washing of the fabric it's a liquid that's added when it's drying. Uh, what and what point of the supply chain is the silicone added? It, it, after in the fabric finishing process, it's after the washing, right as it's entering the stenders to dry, it goes through a little uh, bath with silicone. And what is uh, yeah, liquid. Are you treating the wastewater or not? I guess you should make. If you want to make a story, okay, you should do something about you know filtering out these. These little the waste, right, Re right, and yeah, that's that's very important. Uh, that's something like um, reusing, creating a closed loop system. But for me, the best thing to do is to completely remove it. Like our our goal is to have absolutely no petroleum uh, products in in any of our uh, and any clothes. of the and it can chains. be done. And and so that's what we want to do is um, we want to inform consumers that this is what they should be asking for. 
right now with clothes, there are definitely plastics that the medical industry needs and are necessary, but not with, with everyday normal clothes. We don't have to be using all these polyesters that we're breathing in that are creating microplastic dust. And But people don't know. People don't know that um, the fabric might have polyester for stability and the threads might have polyester and it was synthetically dyed with a chemical finish on top of that. There's so many details people don't know that us as manufacturers were going to communicate, which is why we're looking to do these interviews to break down really what is going on with the microplastics, what are the problems, and what they can ask for mm -hmm. as consumers from other brands. So to inform the consumers yeah. to know what to ask for, because we've confirmed for a fact we don't have to be making clothes, everyday clothes, I mean, with petroleum products. So that can be changed, and it's a quick and easy one that we can change. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good already. But I was just uh, thinking about you know another aspect, and I, I we had a, a project with a, I think it was a live project we call it in Europe, you know, a couple of years ago with the Plastic Soup Foundation, and there were a couple of Italian companies there that that that, that produced fibers for clothes. They were involved there as stakeholders as well, and they have a research institute, etc. And I didn't follow them, you know, in detail anymore. But I think their ultimate goal was to, 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 to design a fiber that is not not so easily released, you know, from from the from the fabric from 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 the product. And uh, so uh, maybe there's something to do there as well, you know, mm -hmm. the way of the way you incorporate these fibers. I have not. I have not also found that up. I mean, a fiber. I think it exists because it's uh, it, it's something like you know uh, the components there, the building blocks are the the nano fibers, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, fibrils, even you fill the small fibrils, and they they, they so in that way you compile a fiber, etc. So there's maybe something to do about that composition as well to make it more. You know um, uh, that it, that's not so easily released from clothes when you when you when you have some friction or you wash it or whatever. Right, and so if I could just ask a couple more questions. What what percentage of the population would you say have microplastics in their bodies right now? If we were to guess. Oh, I don't know. We the, the thing is, this is a very pioneer study but if 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 you want my guess yeah. i think i think almost everybody uh, unless you go plastic free you know yeah. the thing is the thing is what you measure in blood is is just reflecting a very recent exposure because it's eliminated by the blood you know and um. we don't know how it is how it is how it is in the blood you know where is it in the blood is it in the plasma dispersed or is it maybe uh, included in uh, immune cells or maybe in the pores of the placelets, you know, small pieces of plastic. So we don't know anything about that. But what I know is that, and, and there are many studies more and more now, show that, you know, these nanoplastics, uh, also microplastics, are everywhere. You know, if you drink from a cup, mm -hmm. These, yeah. these paper cups with the PE lining inside, you know, mm -hmm. you're exposed to trillions of nanoplastics in one go. So fast numbers. The baby bottles, you know, yeah. plastics, you know, if you heat something in them or you microwave, you know, uh, plastic uh, packaged food, uh, you know it as well. You know, th there are so many studies indicating that. We, but then again, you know, what does it tell us, you know, trillions of nanoplastics mm. uh, if we are exposed to maybe uh, a thousand times more non-nanoplastic particles and no and you see what non-plastic particles so mm -hmm. that that brings me back to my first question how does it uh, fit in the whole picture of this uh, this this all particle world this multi-particle world we live in right well i guess the assumption would be that all animals and then when humans came into existence have been breathing in dust and fibers and from plants 
And like to your point, the question, the second question would be, now how does this chemical, how is that reacting with our body since that's the novel thing? No, 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 no. The thing is, you know, it's the, the, the main concern is with the particle itself, okay? The particle, just the particle, the polymeric particle, or it can be called polymers together, you know, but the particle itself, the, the solid particle, we know if it's in contact with mucous membranes, et cetera, et cetera, or it can, you know, it's in your circulation and ends up, you know, in contact with cells, it can cause a particle toxicity. But regardless, is plastic or not, it's particle toxicity in general. And particle toxicity can cause, we know that, oxidative strength, uh, inflammatory immune re mm -hmm. response reactions, etc. And, 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 and for me, the compelling, the compelling example is, is the, the fine dust we breathe in, you know. The fine dust problem, the air, particulate air pollution, Mm -hmm. That kills, you know, that kills uh, every year uh, millions of people worldwide. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, now we start to understand that plastic particles are also a component of air pollution or particulate air pollution. And we don't know it's how large this fraction is. Maybe it's 1%, 2 maybe it's more, you know, maybe it'll grow in time, I'm not sure. But so it's contributing already there to these disease burden and mortality rates. And today I saw an article, you know, out by, I think, in The Lancet say, you know, uh, it has been estimated that 9 million people die from pollution every year worldwide. And then I say, in my, in, my, in my language, I say, okay, now we're talking because that means, and they didn't say that in The Lancet article, but plastic, plastic particles and all these mm -hmm. chemical entities, plastics have an important uh, and increasing share in this, in this overall pollution, yeah. the particle and chemical exposures. So it's all fiber. It's not yeah. just plastic. Yeah. The yeah. main problem is any particle cotton, yeah. and then now increasing in, share is plastic. Exactly. Now, in addition to particle toxicity, mm -hmm. now we're dealing here with very complex particles. They have different sizes. They have different. Uh, different shapes, etc., but they also have different chemical compositions because they, they can contain chemical additives, for example, and there are thousands of them. And, and, and we know uh, quite a number of them are endocrine chemicals or have carcinogenic properties, etc., etc. We know that. So, um, so they can cause chemical toxicity. Right. But the thing is, and in general, we know that the same chemicals from plastics leach out already into your food before mm -hmm. they become microplastic that we inhale or ingest. So the other pathways of exposure via food are probably more important. And the pathway of these small plastic particles with the chemicals mm -hmm. may maybe a little bit add to the total chemical load in your body of these chemicals, you see, but it's not a lot, except for maybe these very nano-sized plastics, because this chemical reaction, the surface is much larger compared to the, right. and and they can more easily, you know, cross these membranes. So there is something we really need to understand. You know, mm -hmm. are these nano-sized plastic? Can they bring? Can they bring uh, all sorts of chemical additives? For example, in your brain, because the brain blood brain barrier. Only the, the really small particles, smaller than 100 nanometers, are able to cross the blood brain barrier. Or the placenta is another story, you pick a particles can cross that as well. Now, that is one thing. And the other aspect that shows up more and more is that plastics uh, of all sizes, they can, they can uh, act as factors, transport factors for all sorts of microorganisms. Because as soon as a particle or a plastic item mm -hmm. uh, enters the environment, there will be a sort of biofilm formation of plastics. So what I call a plastosphere, you know, that comprises um, 
lipids and all these organic matter, but, but also uh, microbes, like bacteria, viruses, etc. Et now, there are studies now that show that plastics, they contain a different, a different let's say, uh, community of, of, of bacteria mm -hmm. and even viruses. I think, you know, there's some indication there as well. Then uh, non-plastic substrates, non-plastic particles. Now, that is quite interesting because there's also indications that uh, plastics can also uh, contain quite a lot of um, micro-antibacterial uh, uh, yeah. resistance genes and, and bacteria, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And so, these plastic particles are very light in general, but they can even be easily spread by wind and water. That's why it's everywhere around the world, you know. The atmospheric deposition is enormous. The stuff that goes in the air here may end up on the North Pole, by means of speaking. Yeah. So uh, that's quite interesting because that means that that plastics can can act, maybe can can increase the risk of infection if you inhale them or eat them or you're in touch with them. Um, they contain certain pathogenic bacteria, human pathogenic bacteria, and. Uh, and there's another hypothesis that says, you know, maybe COVID, the COVID-19 virus is, mm -hmm. is, is, you know, more prevalent on plastic substrates than on non-plastic substrates. Now, there you go. And mm -hmm. go back to the fine dust problem again mm -hmm. in the air. These are the aerosols. So there are plastic aerosols there as well. Now, these are all the different aspects of the potential health risks or effects of micro nanoplastics. So when we when a COVID when a person that has COVID is wearing a face mask, which I think is made partially with is made with plastic. Yeah. It's basically you're rebreathing yeah. in the bacteria. Yeah. Yeah, there has been a study there showing that um, at one side it protects you against uh, all these nasty viruses and bacteria from the outside and also right. plastic particles. But at the same time, you know, particularly when you reuse the mask and it's a bit uh, teared and weird, you know, it can release directly these plastic particles from the inside, from this plastic component in the mask itself. So you breathe in. But then if you look at the total oral picture, mm -hmm. it is still, uh, you know, the net, net result is that you are breathing in less microplastics when you wears the, these masks. You breathe even less when you wear the mask? Yeah. Because it protects you against, you know, breathing in the microplastics uh, that are <sighs> retained in the mask itself. Oh. Filled out, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's beneficial wow. to have a mask anyhow. But you will still be exposed to the, the microplastics that are generated from the inside of the mask. Just much less. But which is much less. <sighs> So in the wow. beginning, before polyester, where we had plastics made, we had issues of just particles in general from cotton, from other plants. And now that we've made polyester, now we're adding in to more particles going into our body. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. And so if I understood correctly, so the first thing is just particular in general. And then the next step is what is this uh, microplastics doing to our body, but in reality, we're getting more exposure outside of it until we come to the point of the nanoparticles, which are so small that they could be passing our membranes and the and what chemical additives they might be taking with it, as well as um, microbial film around the plastic. Yeah, so, well, the eco-corona or the bio-corona, bio corona yeah, and that is quite interesting because this corona around on the surface of this particle that contains, you know, uh, the whole community, it's a little ecosystem itself, mm -hmm. but it's it's changing. It depends, of course, in the environment, it depends on the surrounding conditions, the temperature, what right. sort of organisms are there, bacteria in the environment, etc., etc. And some of these bacteria like plastics, so they will do a good job on plastics, much better than in the water or the sediments. And so that is one thing. But as soon as you you swallow them, 
they have to go through your stomach, which, which are very harsh conditions. So, the, so this corona will change, but as soon as it enters your blood, mm-hmm. it will change again because there will be a plasma corona formation. So these are overlapping coronas. And bit by bit, we start to understand that this corona formation is playing a role in the fate and toxicity of, this, of these plastic particles. So if you if you dose virgin plastics without a corona and you use weathered uh, plastic that have a corona mm-hmm. uh, and you expose an animal to that, you will see obviously in, 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 with the weathered plastic you see more effect than the virgin plastic. So there is something to um, to untangle there. It's it's, it's quite uh, intriguing, you know. But the, the, there's, a, there's a lot we don't know actually what's what's happening there and. Um, yeah, but of course, uh, you said the nano is the problem, but we also find, uh, you know, microplastics, uh, uh, micro-sized plastics in in, 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 in in all sort of organisms inside of, you know, uh, dogs, chickens, uh, marine organisms, for example. So it's not only the very small nano size, but these are more dangerous because obviously they can more easily uh, be absorbed by your body and bring maybe more chemicals in, 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 to, uh, to certain organs or whatever, deliver them there. And what's what we call, it's a sort of, um, maybe a sort of uh, time-released delivery, you know, if these mm-hmm. chemicals, if these nanoplastics, uh, if this is an hypothesis, if they can bring certain neurotoxic chemicals to your brain and they accumulate in your brain, they can be time released, you know, from these plastics into your brain, uh, fluids or whatever. And so there is a lot of things we don't know uh, if this is the case. Maybe we, they lose all these chemicals already when they cross these membranes in the first place, you know, we don't know. And so again, a lot of questions, Mark. Wow. And I heard from Dr. Shanna Swan that uh, she has a theory that phthalates are affecting our hormones. Yeah. Um, particularly in males. Uh, is that another, because the phthalates are in the plastics or leaching out of the plastics? Yeah. Yeah. These are the plasticizers. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, and bisnol A is another one. Uh, phthalates and, and bro- these are all endocrine disruptive chemicals. So, they can affect. Uh, uh, they can affect um, particularly uh, developmental uh, processes, so the early life, uh, development of the fetus, etc. Uh, in certain within certain time windows, already at a very low concentrations, uh, that can you know these effects we think pop up, show up sometimes even generations later. You know what we call epigenetic effects. And uh, mm-hmm. in that way, we know, for example, that endocrine disrupting chemicals, there are some estimates there, and these conservative estimates, you know, they can, let's say that they, they contribute 2% to, 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 to all sorts of diseases. There are associations there. Mm-hmm. You know, the endocrine disrupting chemicals are associated with uh, the modern diseases like, uh, like uh, um, uh, diabetes, obesity. Uh, oh, yeah. Cancers, uh, certain cancers, etc., etc., etc. Parkinson. Uh, so all these diseases, uh, even if the contribution is only two percent, because mm-hmm. all these diseases are multifactorial, divine, you know. But two percent uh, is is already it's not much, maybe you would say, you know. But that cost that will cost you know the healthcare billions and billions of euros every year. You know? So if you make that sort of estimates. Mm-hmm. And that we try to do, you know, you probably have to do to, to more and more to convince the industry that what they're doing is, is, is cutting their own profits. You know, it's, it's, it's contradicted because, because um, the, the, uh, the health effects and the environmental impacts are huge. And, and, uh, and they do it, you know, it's coming lastly from, from these products, the microplastics. And they know it. I think they know it. Most of them know it. All these sorts of things. You know, they, they, uh, they. I find the, the the lobby of the plastic industry uh, very difficult. You know, they they really know what they're doing. Yeah. 
orchestrate a process. It's all profits. It's all the green, uh, the green figures in the eye, yeah. you know, the dollar figures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, we're seeing that in the clothing industry as well. Um, the amount of fabric loss that there is. So we, when we make our clothes, we have to cut. We take a fabric that's like this, and then we draw in the items, and then we cut. And you're always going to have a fabric loss. It's without a doubt. It's just the fabric left over. But with that fabric we lived over, we, we reuse it again for stuffing, for pillowcases or other ideas that we have. But in regular clothing companies that do polyester, it doesn't, it's not feasible because it's so cheap, the material, that they just throw it away. So it's, and it's so much fabric loss that's coming from this. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, so I, it's all about money in the end. It's just, there's not worth to reuse it so you can stop making poly virgin polyester again. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, sorry, Renzo, did you have one last question? Yeah, just to end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and thank you again for your time. I was So what is the solution here? Because the solution <laughs> we have as, you know, in our company is to just stop using plastics and the petroleum-based uh, products and chemicals. What, what is the solution you're seeing? Well, the solution I see is that we have to, to uh, reduce the amount of plastic in the system. In the, in the, in the, with the system, I mean in the economic system, your households everywhere, you know, they reduce mm -hmm. the amount of plastics. A lot of plastics is not really, you don't use it, you know, you, it's not, not necessary. It, 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 it is overdone, etc., etc. So reduce the amount of plastic is one thing. The next thing is stop, the, you know, reduce the, uh, so you reduce also the production of plastics partly. Mm -hmm. And I think the key is to, to identify the, these ugly and bad ones and to replace them, to replace them with eco-friendly materials. Exactly what you guys are doing. Yeah. And this transition, uh, we said that already 10 years ago, even 15 years ago, but it's, it's not happening yet enough, you know, there is some movements, but it's not enough. It's not fast enough, you know, we maybe we have only 10, 20 years to go. People, some people say that. Eh? And then you can see that we're talking about a problem here that is completely overshadowed mm -hmm. by other crises like climate change, mm -hmm. like, like uh, air pollution. Mm -hmm. But all these crises are interlinked. Yeah. Plastic produces CO2 emissions if you make them. Plastic is a component of air pollution. I just explained that. So you want clean air, you have to get rid of these plastics too, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So you have, I think you, we have to combine, you know, our efforts, joint forces to, to fight against all these, these different, uh, together, these crises rather than you say, let's fight against microplastics. If you want to fight against microplastics, you have to fight against, you have to see it in a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Microplastics are part of the whole problem. It's, the whole problem is plastic in this case. Yeah. Most plastic, microplastics come from lots of plastic items. There are also the primary plastics that are produced intensely in small particles, you know, in cosmetics and all these things, but most of them come from lots. Of, so you have to, to fight against the plastic. Yeah debris production in general. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we place them by more, uh, we place the ugly ones and the bad ones by uh, eco-friendly uh, materials, which is not easy to say, you know, I, I know that. Okay. But uh, there are movements going on like yours, like yours, you know, that, uh, that I think are very, very, uh, very good uh, in initiatives, you know. That, uh, We're getting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're trying to get there. Well, um, thank you so much for your time. Um, we would also like to give you some some items for you to have and enjoy. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I'll, I'll email you asking for your size and your address and everything. Wow, well, nice. thank you very much. <laughs> okay. I have a young kid, so uh, I will. This is also key, eh? education. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, yeah. Right. And yeah. We have to talk at the youth, particularly. Exactly. This is the next. This is the the the, the future. You know, is with the the young children. Now. Yeah.
we yeah. can change, you know, the mentality and our of ourselves. I live here in Spain. And there are still people that throw everything in the environment. They have no idea. Maybe they have other problems, you know, to think about, you know. But yeah. there is no consciousness. There's no awareness enough. But we have to teach the the, the, the schools now, the yeah. young generations, because they have the future of this planet. Maybe they exactly. can make a change there. They can. So that's I'm I'm particularly working on. Yeah, exactly. That that that's our mission with the brand. It's not just to sell cool clothing, but it's to it's to educate. It's to show what is uh, what a supply chain that's plastic free. How can we do that? Yeah. Um, so we're really grateful for your time and thank you so Are much you for everything. <laughs> Take care there and have a well. What can I say? Uh, you do an excellent job. <laughs> Thanks so much. Have a plastic free day. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thanks so much, Nick. We appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Hi, I'm Ellie from Aya Eco Fashion. In 2021, we set up our studio in Lima, Peru to take sustainability into our own hands. We make biodegradable plastic-free clothes from the highest quality Pima cotton and alpaca wool. Plastic-free shirts, shorts, sports bras, and underwear, all made from cotton threads, labels, and bands. Every detail matters to us. We source the fiber, knit the yarn, make all of the clothes at single origin in Peru, and send them directly to you from our U.S. and European distribution centers. If you would like more information about sustainable clothes, check us out at ecoaya.com. And if you're in Europe, check us out at ecoaya.eu.